special presentation for the Sudman Lecture Series. For those that don't know, Sudman Lecture Series and um, Money Talks were supposed to happen at the beginning of this month at the World's Fair of Money, but since it canceled, we moved it all to e-learning, so thanks so much for your flexibility. Um, if you have any questions during this presentation, you will have to use the chat feature or the Q&A feature here in Zoom. The questions will come to me and then I'll share them with Fred at the end of the presentation. Um, we cannot hear or see you, so please use those, those features there. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to send out a um, survey here using the poll feature in Zoom. Please use it. It's only um, nine questions, very easy, and it'll help us to improve for the future. So now I'm going to turn it over to Fred Schwan. He's going to speak on uh, women in military numismatics. Enjoy. Hello. Well, as, as Brianna said, I, I'm Fred Swan, probably known to many of you. And we're going to talk about women in military numismatics. Now, <laughs> the term military numismatics is, is I'd say, weak at this point. It, it, it's not flushed out, hasn't been used very long. Good chance there'll be a better uh, term that we can use to, to cover the, the numismatics of military operations. And we got along without a term for a long time. It we, turns out we didn't need a term for what we do until uh, Gail Baker came up with the idea of having a class on the, on this stuff for which we didn't have a name at the time. And so now we call it military numismatics. And primarily we talk about World War II and after, but recently I've been including some World War I materials and frankly, the current operations in uh, the Middle East are, pr are producing things. Now, Many of you may have experienced this with your uh, friends at home in your community that, uh, uh, but with me, I, everybody in town is afraid to have a cup of coffee with me because I can find numismatics in anything. We sit there and have a coffee, or at least before the virus, it could sit and have a cup of coffee and I would find something to talk numismatics. I would make them uh, listen to me talk about numismatics. And the same thing happens at the World's Fair of Money and numismatic events that I go to, people run when they see me coming because they know I will twist anything and make it into a military numismatic uh, topic, which I realized only about an hour ago getting ready for the presentation here. And Brianna's intro slide here with Sacagawea on the $1 coin, that is a military numismatics item. There we have Sacagawea, a, an Indian scout leading a military operation in 18, three, four, five, when, whenever it was. And so by my convoluted way of looking at things, that is a military numismatics item. And I'll be using the same kind of logic on some other things. So you can feel, uh, feel free to disagree on some of my conclusions and you can argue with me about it uh, via questions at the end or uh, later on, on the phone or email, whatever. So right there is our first military numismatics item of the day, the Sacagawea dollar. So uh, Rosie the Riveter, well-known, iconic, iconic view. Um, and we'll, we'll have, talk a little bit more about Rosie the Riveter later on. There's many ways for us to look at this and get that last part for sure. Remember, there are no rules. So Ruth Hill was one of the great numismatists. She was far, far ahead of her time. She collected world paper money, but specifically military paper money or military operations before 1960. I mean, it, before 1960, there was hardly anybody collected world paper money. There was hardly anybody collected United States paper money pre-1960, but Ruth Hill collected the money of the Second World War. And she had a, she was a great person. She supported the hobby in many ways and was a, a great, great collector. Uh, I came short of saying I wanted to de dedicate the program to her uh, because it sounded a little presump presumptuous on my part. But a little twist on it is, uh, 
only way late last night, actually early this morning, like two o'clock this morning, uh, I decided, well, gee, I, I already had prepared, had the slide prepared for Ruth Hill. And I looked online, did a search for Ruth Hill, not expecting to find anything. And I found a tribute to Ruth on the, on the internet. I don't remember if it was in Wikipedia or where, and it had her birth year, which I did not know as 1898. So I was able to update the slide this morning based upon just that chance uh, checking last night. I was quite surprised to find it there. Uh, so other women that we know, uh, what well, Ruth, we know she gets her credit as being a, a numismatist. These two women are, were veterans of World War II and might be well, their name or their connection might be well known to you. Uh, on the right is Joe Bowling's grandmother. She served in, in Europe and Eisenhower's uh, staff. And on the left is Joe Bowling's aunt. Joe Bowling um, and I collaborated to publish World War II Remembered, History in Your Hands, a numismatic study in 1995, the standard reference for military numismatics. Much needing of an update, and uh, which people complain to us all the time about wanting a, uh, an update, but I can't make any promises. So this picture was in our in that book in 1995, and I thought it was appropriate to give them a little more uh, visibility uh, with this program. So just recently, uh, I was turned on to this book, Lady GI, by Kathy Freeland. Kathy's known to to maybe many of you, certainly is well known to mismatist. And she had found this book and she read it and she enjoyed it. It's about this lady who was a whack in the Women's Army Corps in, in World War II and wrote this book, her uh, memoir, so to speak, of the experiences of World War II. And she told me about it and she wrote a review and I got a copy of the book and, and devoured it. And it had quite a bit of numismatic information in it. So, uh, We'll mention her again, some of the things she told us in the book as it applies to things we look at later on. But uh, it was quite a, uh, an astonishing thing to find uh, multiple pages of material of interest in numismatists, especially military, somebody interested in military numismatics. And we just have a little uh, first day cover here for the honoring uh, women's, women's service and one of the things I like about this uh, particular first day cover is this, the pencil address down here, Toledo Stamp Company, 407, uh, I can't quite make it out anyway, Toledo, Ohio. Sorry, I couldn't quite make it out. Anyway, so to me, I like that because I visited that stamp uh, shop as a kid. So uh, for me, that's a personal artifact as well as a, uh, a per peripheral item for our military numismatic studies. So where these are American Red Cross girls, they call themselves girls, not, not, nothing disrespectful here, but instead of calling them ladies or women, and, but they called themselves girls, themselves girls at the time, and they were all over the world. And... Um, just in case I forget to mention it later on, that they had probably thousands of clubs to in total uh, around the world during the Second World War. When you consider that they had hundreds just in the United Kingdom, that they probably had thousands at one time or another around the world in World War II. And many of them were open for just a short time and then the, the troops would move on and the, the girls would move on and establish another club. And you can, can you guess where they're arriving there? I'm sure you can tell. They're coming down the gangplank in Australia. So that's just a sort of random picture of some women arriving in Australia. Now we're getting closer to some, the real deal. So what is trench art? What is it and why do we care? All right, here's a classic, classic trench art item. Think. In this case, think uh, shell casing. So this is a World War I uh, item made from a, an artillery canister, probably a 105, maybe a 75. 
and uh, been made into a, an umbrella stand or just a knickknack in the corner. So it, to qualify as trench art, it, it has to be a handcrafted item made from the detritus of the conflict, usually by or for the participants. Trench art, let's think about that a minute. So this is a World War I item and you call it tr trench art and we think immediately of a soldier pounding that out in the trenches. Usually didn't happen that way. Usually it was, it was made by uh, more rear personnel than, pe than personnel in the trenches. Um, what else was I gonna say? In, in fact, very often it was not even made by, not only not in the trench, it was not even by an individual soldier, but by either an, a soldier who had the skills or even uh, craftsmen downtown in the village and where the GIs, when they got a chance, would go and, and be buying souvenirs. So the term trench art, the trench uh, will get you in trouble if you think about trench. And even somebody, Joe Bowling, who I mentioned earlier, one time sort of challenged me on whether it's even art as opposed to a craft. So it's neither trench nor art, but, it, but still it's trench art. And all, you also have to remember there are no rules. So um, I was trying to think of something else right there. Oh, oh that, uh, and, and even when it was made it is, there can be a wide latitude uh, about whether it's even made during the time of the conflict. But the, key, the keys are that it's handcrafted and from the detritus or the leftover materials of the war, which conveniently for us includes then coins. So here we have a, an artil another artillery canister uh, made into an ashtray and the cigarette rests are made out of bent coins. So this goes from being just a trench art item to being something, to being a military numismatic item. So for, for purposes, so for our purposes, we want to think notes and coins or our numismatic, uh, military numismatics. So the first kind of um, items that we'll look at are, are coin trench art. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not coin trench art, but uh, short snorters. In a taxonomy that I support, short snorters, which are souvenirs made of paper money, where the soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, and others, and civilians for that matter, created a souvenir by signing uh, notes and, with their friends, and everybody signs them and creates a souvenir. And so in the taxonomy, as I said, that I support, that those fall under the category of trench art. Now here, this wonderful view of the GI showing his, his trench art or his short snorter to some fellows and a woman in the background there with it. They're all having their Cokes. This is an Coca-Cola advertisement from during the war. Amazingly, one of the things that I collect in World War II is advertising. Can you believe it? I collect all this other stuff and I collect advertising. And uh, gee, I, I have every single advertisement in a short one. No, of course not. But uh, very often you can find interesting things like this in advertising. We'll have a few more advertisements uh, throughout this program. So here we have a short snorter. And uh, actually my own screen is obscuring me a little bit. Up here at the top, I can't see it, but it should say ARC right there. American Red Cross. Now, some of the things you notice when you, when you first look at this short snorter, you see that the ends have residue of tape. Very often the, the short snorters are taped together, sometimes in very, very long strings of, uh, of notes that are taped together. Uh, often soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and so forth, would like to get a note of every country that they visited. So they may not have enough signatures for all of the notes, but they still would get a, a note from each country that they visited. So uh, this was 
this should be an American Red Cross up up in here. And let's see, what else did I want to tell you about this? Uh, I can't think of anything else right offhand. So I gave you some cherry picking tips down here. When you we see the American Red Cross up there, but here are some others that you might watch for if you're, if you're looking for women on short snorters. Now you want, I won't go over all of those. Probably most of you know most of them, but HRH is, is different. It doesn't actually lead you to uh, women. HRH is for his or her Royal Highness, which I'm, overwhelmingly in World War II would be his, but I'm trying to think. I don't know, uh, young Queen Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth then, might have been out around some places and signed uh, a short snorter or two. But that would be a tremendous find today to find a short snorter that Princess Elizabeth had signed. Uh, be a great find. But the one story I wanted to tell you is this right here that I only added that in the last couple of hours. Um, oh, I, I'm forgetting one part of it. That's the, what is it? Air transport, oh geez, what is it? Um, and then they, they had, uh, I'm sorry, hang on, with, hang with me a minute. Uh, Oh no! Oh, I know. Never mind. I have a. It comes up later. I'm going to show you later on on the the note where I learned about it today. My I just learned about it today. Although I, I'm not a serious short snorter collector, that um, I have some and I watch for them and I save images of them and I like them a lot and I regret that I didn't collect them more seriously longer for a longer period of time. But oh well. So here we have another another note, this one being uh, an, uh, an Asian note. I don't know what it is right offhand. And here we have, it says ANC, American Nurse Corps. And then it looks like gorilla, but it can't be. Chief Nurse and then Major somebody and Headquarters Base. Can't make that out right now. So a, a fascinating and wonderful piece. Ah, so here we have a little, this is a small note, it's an Allied military uh, yen piece. And um, with one, two, three, four, five signatures on it. And um, so you have Mary here and you have Anne here and Jack, and maybe, I don't know, could it be Brad, Brad Blue? But you're gonna love it. Look at this, Fred Swan down here. Fred, Fred, middle initial A, Swan. Can you believe it? No, I'm lying, I made it up. But you can convince yourself of almost anything on these short snorters sometimes, and it's hard to read the names. Remember, during World War II, we're talking about signing them with fountain pens. No ball points in World War II. They're all, all uh, fountain pens. In fact, I have it on my list to do some work on gathering some fountain pens and practice signing on notes to sort of a reenactment. I like reenactments of all kinds. So I wanna work on that one of these days. Ah, so here you have, here's a great picture of, um, Somebody signing, this woman, Jinx Falkenberg, signing this short snorter. Now, she's a big star, I guess. I, I still haven't ever heard of her. Also on my list of things to do is to, to um, find out what movie she was in or whatever and, and have a look at some of her movies. Or if, there, if that's what she did. I assume that's what she did. Maybe she was a singer. But here's the whole note with, with her signature right here. And up here we have the date and this wonderful drawing in the watermark window. So the 
this is a really nice short story. Lots and lots of signatures. You could study this one for a very long time and have lots of fun with it. And uh, I certainly don't own this. This was sent to me, this image was sent to me by um, Steve Pomex. That, um, so here's Joe Jackson. I'm, I'm, don't believe that's shoeless Joe Jackson, the baseball player. And it's not impossible, but I don't remember after the scandal in the teens, did he continue as a celebrity or, or was he a hated, hated person? I don't know the answer. So lots of good stuff there. All right, here's a great, great one that I like a lot. I might even own this one. I, <laughs> one of the things with me, my collecting, all this different stuff that I collect and accumulate, often I get to, ha to have the joy of finding more than once. So I, at a show or a price list or an eBay auction or something, I find I might have a chance and discover something and buy it. And then I bury it in my stuff and I years, maybe even years later, find it again. Or as in the case of, of these images that I am showing you here, that I just found them on my computer, just got to sort for, sort for a short snorter and see what came up. And, uh, but I seem to think that I might have this one that, because I like aviation as well. Here we have California Clipper. And with the date over here, night in, um, I can't read it. Oh yeah, 11, 20, 20 something, 45, which is pretty late to, to call it an actual World War II trench art item, except, except it's on a, and on a Hawaii note. So it's on a Hawaii note. So geez, that's gotta make it good enough. And, uh, and then here you have, uh, again, I can't read it, Hel oh, Helen. So you have uh, on the face of it, Helen signed it. So here's a great research no note, as was that previous one actually, that uh, with Jinx, you could maybe find some uh, stars and stripes or other accounts of when she traveled where, or even in newspapers, if that may have been in uh, the US of when she was traveling where, and maybe we'll find out the date of that picture um, and, uh, and other details about it. So it might be possible to find out about this China Clipper flight on, the, on this date and even a manifest of who was on it and uh, short snorters lend themselves to that kind of, of, of research if you're into it. And I'll, I don't do it a lot. Um, but, but it's certainly fun. I'm jumping ahead here to see where, okay. Now this is a counter example, or a, I don't know if it's a counter example or not, but a, uh, we'll see it. You'll hear what I mean in a minute. So here, here's a, on a um, bank of communication, Chinese bank of communications note, B Burma Roadster Don, and I like, I picked out this name right here, Alice uh, T-Shot, I get T-Bolt, 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 I'm not sure right. Uh, but the key to that is, uh, and one of the few researches that I have done is I put her in, the, in the Google and came up with a good, some good biographical information on her. She, Born in 1902, died 1998, and uh, was an interior designer in civilian life after the war, where she, uh, one of her most prominent uh, projects, she designed the interior of the chapel at the Air Force Academy. So uh, quite a prominent person. And there's all lots more here just on, on this one note, you can spend lots and lots and lots of time and uh, have great fun uh, doing that. Ah, this is a favorite. Um, so this note, it's a Bank of Canada note, but I, uh, five years ago, three other guys and I went on a big journey from, we went from Northwest Ohio up north into Canada and through Labrador and in the, onto the island of, of uh, Newfoundland. But actually this is 
while we're in Labrador at, at uh, Goose Bay, at, a, at the military base, air base in Goose Bay, they have a military museum, uh, mostly on the history of the base. And this note, and um, a U.S. note of, I don't remember what the U.S. note was, but this note was in the, in the display case. And so uh, here it is, is still the show very, oh yeah, F.O. So F.O. is that flight officer, first officer, I'm not sure, but Opal Anderson. And then this is where I added ATA just today, Air Transport Auxiliary, ATA, USA. So here it is, Margaret something, ATA, USA. So Air Transport Auxiliary, and I read on the internet today, they sometimes call themselves, instead of Air Transport Auxiliary, they call themselves Ancient and Tattered Airmen. Because the ATA, which would use the ferry air, they ferried aircraft around, and they would take anybody who could fly an aircraft, they didn't stick with the, uh, the routine kinds of restrictions. They had people with one leg and one, with one arm and with one eye, all kinds of infirmities they would accept as long as they could skillfully or at least adequately uh, fly the aircraft. So that's the uh, ATA. So that makes, uh, oh, this one up, it says AT, it's ATA up here as well. I missed that uh, even before. It has USA over ATA. So Opal Anderson for sure was ATA, and so um, I don't know. I have to research that, if, put it on my list. In the ATA, did they have a rank structure that included F, uh, first officers? Probably it's just the, the crew title as opposed to an actual rank. But you can have, uh, you can have lots of fun um, researching that, and, and don't let me – don't – think I would be upset if you researched it because I probably won't ever get to it. All right, um, now we're going to coins. Remember, so coins, trench art is part of, um, and we have the note trench art. And um, so here um, we have the first thing that was discussed at length in that, in that book in uh, Lady G.I. She has a long description of how in Australia, she and some of her colleagues, that is female soldiers, were greeted by Australian, no, by U.S. soldiers with all kinds of, of trench art trinkets made to try to lure the attention of these women. The, this the woman describes uh, her dating prospects in Australia, as she said, as being very good, the ratio of U.S. men to women was about 10,000 to one. So she, they had good odds, she said. Now th this bracelet be of the type that they would have been offering. And you can see that it's made from Australian coins. And with this heart also, usually also made with a coin. And this is not a particularly fine example, but I just had to put this one in because you can see this one is named for Judy. And Judy, as some of you know, is my wife's name. She's also a numismatist and an a, a member. So I just had to start the coin part of the presentation with this Judy bracelet. Made by, again, made with coins. Um, you can often, you can find many, many, many varieties and interesting things done with the coins. Now these are all capped, I think. That is curved. They would curve the coins and often you'll find them where these the links are made also out of coins these were not at least don't appear to be and the, the clasps are often uh, well first of all they're often missing as in this case and then they're often also made out of coins so that adds greatly to them and great great variety in the in the bracelets they made so here we have a classic this is a classic uh, trench art coin. So Bert had this engraving made for his mother. Almost certainly Bert did not hand grave this himself. Someone in his unit was doing it, who was skilled at doing it, or somebody down 
town in the ville, local village was uh, making them and selling them to the to the folks, this, and mostly to send home, or possibly as a, a, a pocket piece. This is being a little unusual, not having any kind of mounting. So this could have been a, uh, yeah, a purse piece would be more like it, going to mother. But I'll certainly sent to mother by Bert. Oh, just I mean, just thought of something else that I just that I forgot. I'm sorry. So here we have. This is a good example of a, a pseudo dog tag made out of an Australian florin. So this is a classic kind of trench art that we have in, in Australia for the war and uh, very classic. And I wanna point out right here's the, the mint mark S. So most of these coins that were made for, that were used for the trench art were struck in the United States, which I find is a, a, a pleasant, pleasant um, extra to the whole numismatic adventure of it. So look up here, this is, so Dolores Lechner, and look at her serial number here, A708072, I guess. But isn't that A interesting? The I've been told, haven't ever been able to confirm, that that A is for ARC, American Red Cross. That that's an American Red Cross serial number. Well, that's true or not, I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you at this time. But, uh, and again, maybe somebody, maybe somebody out there knows. Also, we have down here, so we have the C, I'm pretty sure with this being used as a pseudo dog tag, is, I think, for Catholic. Uh, religion is usually given on a dog tag or identification tag. But what is the BT? Bravo Tango. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so actually, let me back up. So my, my take on it is this was made for Dolores in her, in her serial number. And then her next of kin, her mother in St. Louis, and then whatever BT is and C for Catholic. Now, whether she sent that off to her mother or where she wore that, I, there's no way of knowing, of course, um, at least not based on what we have now. On some others, it might be possible from other documents or whatever to uh, determine that, but not here. So here we have an Italian, very unusual, very non-typical format for a trench art coin used as a palette and uh, engrave this uh, woman's portrait. And whether it's a, ge a generic woman or the specific woman, I can't say for sure, but my guess is it's the specific woman. And likely it was done downtown in the village that the fellow would give, gave a picture to the artist and the artist made it. Um, very, very un unusual style, very unusual. Uh, really striking coin for Sergeant Williams, his serial number in uh, the Balkans, 1913-1918, and love to Jess. So uh, on a French five franc, I believe. So really quite, quite a striking, quite a striking piece, but nothing compared to this one. Look at this one. To dear mother from Jim, German East Africa, 1915. So this is World War I, um, piece made for, uh, by, for Jim, for, for his mother. And um, there was um, a lot more activity in Africa in World War I than I had thought. When I started out collecting tr coin trench art, I, I restricted myself to World War II. I, I refused World War I. And that was about 10 years ago that I started with the World War II. Uh, having collected World War II stuff for 30 or 40 years, I've added something else to start collecting in that greater, under that umbrella, and that was coin trench art. 
And um, so I started doing that seriously, but I said, no, I'm not going to get sucked into doing more. I, that's enough to do just in World War One. i I'm sorry, World War Two. But then when the centennial of World War One was coming around, I just got sucked in and, and couldn't resist. And in fact, in addition, one of the reasons, one of the things that got me into it is I got a chance to buy part of a collection and uh, that included World War One, and this piece was in it. And I said, wow, that's so nice. I certainly have to keep that for my collection. And then you know how that goes. Uh, you got one piece, you got to have 500 more. And um, one of the things that I learned in researching this piece and researching the war in Africa is that the uh, movie African Queen of, of hauling that, uh, that uh, patrol boat down to Lake Tanzanica was a, a real event in World War One. Now, it, it wasn't with uh, one man and one woman, but um, they actually carried overland a, a patrol boat to try and, uh, with the plan of using it to get control of Lake Tanzanica. And uh, <laughs> I read a book on it, uh, quite, a, quite a, a story. So we'll see at least one more coin trench art, and maybe another short snorter later on. But another thing, uh, another area that actually Joe and I introduced to the greater community in 1995 with the publication of World War II Remembered was what we call it financing the war to be a general term. And in the case of the United States, that meant defense and war bonds. Very, there could be other things that were liberty, there were, um, well, for World War One, there were liberty loan bonds and there were victory loans and various names that were used, but for the U.S. used basically used defense and war. So the first uh, defense bonds were issued in the United States on May 1st, 1941. So that's uh, seven months or so before Pearl Harbor, but they were issuing defense bonds. So they issued Series E uh, defense bonds, which would have been right in keeping with the series. Uh, they started out with Series A savings bonds called baby bonds in 1935, Series A, and then they progressed up through Series D. And then in May of 41, before when they released the Series E bonds, instead of just being Series E savings bonds, they were a Series E defense bonds. So um, right here we have, uh, here's Rosie the Riveter, of course, but he, I, I call this a Rosie the Riveter bond. The, um, of course, this issued January 45, so chronologically it maybe isn't where, where it belongs, but look at this name. So Miss Lena McGroom in S Seattle, Washington, she, I would say that she had come from Hedinger, North Dakota. Her mother was uh, Mrs. Bertha Mueller in, in Hedinger, North Dakota. Now, Hedinger, I looked up, and they had a population, I think, of 2,500 in, in, the, in the wartime. And here, the key to, the whole, to the, this exposition is, here it is, the, the agency that sold it to her was the Boeing Aircraft Company, Boeing Aircraft Company, of course, still in, in business today. And so my take on it is that Miss McGrum was a classic Rosie the Riveter. Whether she was doing, doing exactly riveting, I would say she went from the rural North Dakota to the big city in Seattle to work in the airplane plant and support the war effort. I would say classic, classic Rosie the Riveter. Of course, I'm just inferring all that. Oh, what a great picture this is. Another thing that I collect <laughs> and buy is pictures. That's a great thing about the electronic auctions that we didn't have before, is you can do searches. So I buy lots of pictures. Uh, I shouldn't say buy lots. I buy as m about as many as I can. Uh, that is about all that I find that are relevant for us. So here we have uh, a pose photo op selling bonds. This is Mrs. Morgenthau selling bonds to the 
the women who were in charge of the respective women's uh, services. I've got the complete um, caption for that. If anybody needs it or needs to know sometime, I could send it to you. That it, it was pretty long and detailed with all their names and such, but I thought it was just quite wonderful. Here's the Minuteman flag in the background and set up here is the backdrop for the photo op. But this is Mrs. Morgenthau here. I thought this was uh, my very first time. I thought it might be Mrs. Roosevelt, but certainly not Mrs. Roosevelt, but a wonderful picture nonetheless. And here's the women working in the bowels of Bureau of Engraving and Printing, preparing the bonds. And so wonderful picture with so many of the bonds being shown. Now, of course, these, the way these are fanned out, again, it's shown it was a, a photo op. But nonetheless, how wonderful it is to have a, a picture like this. This was a, a picture that was in National Geographic. I bought the picture on eBay and the person had correctly identified it on eBay, on eBay as what issue it was in and all that. But I still had to find out. I assumed it was part of a big uh, story on the BEP or something like that. And so I had to find that issue and I did and it wasn't, it was just sort of a random picture published in that particular issue. It was not supported by other uh, pictures from the Bureau, but a great picture nonetheless. And another picture from the Bureau. How about this? Thanksgiving Day, 1942. So they're, they're eating at their desks. And once again, look at the bonds spread all, all over here. Thousands and thousands. <laughs> so uh, uh, mostly a few uh, women of color here. And uh, so Thanksgiving Day, is that, is that incredible? And here you have a press room and you can see the reflection of the bond. So there's the, the plate of four up, large size uh, defense or war bonds. I just remember something I forgot to tell you there. I'll, I'll get caught up on that. So in, in, in May of 41, when they issued the, the first defense bonds, they also issued series F and G defense bonds. That was new. Um, so, so these could be series E, F, or G. Series E was f for the general public. The series F was for corporations, nonprofits, and things like that. And series G was current interest uh, bonds. that They sent you interest every six months. Instead of accruing interest, the series G bonds paid the interest. So here we have some bonds themselves. Um, so look at the top one. This is a tremendous bond. Uh, Jim Downey did research on this one. So this is made to Miss Faye Don, Chinese detachment, Luke Field, Phoenix, Arizona. So this Faye Don, I can't remember all the details that Downey researched it, but the, she worked, I think, I think she um, spoke Chinese and was a translator and worked at, uh, at this Chinese detachment which is where Chinese uh, students came uh, for flight training at, at Luke Field in Arizona. And so if you were a Chinese uh, officer student to coming to learn, you'd be assigned to the, the Chinese detachment and, um, and Miss Don worked there in the, in the detachment. That's just a really spectacular and cool item. And, it's one of the one of the beauties of collecting the bonds is they have all this additional information. We often say when they have an old coin, they say, "Gee, if you, if we could just tell stories of where it's been." Well, the bonds do a better job of that than a than a circulating coin because here we know who bought it and who was their next of kin, and even and where did they buy it, and when did they buy it, and uh, it's really cool. So then we have so here we have a ten dollar. So the $10 bond was not issued. Well, first of all, let's go back to in May of, of 
41 when the defense bonds were issued. And then Pearl Har Harbor was attacked on December 7th and the population clamored that they didn't want to buy no more stinking defense bonds. They wanted war bonds. So I think it was April 42, they introduced war bonds, essentially replacing the defense bonds with war bonds, series E, F, and G. Once again, making it complex and fascinating. Uh, now, as the finest tradition of the BEP and Treasury uh, and others, they continued to issue the existing stocks of defense bonds. So they started manufacturing the war bonds in April of 42 and selling them forthwith. But if, if the agencies selling the bonds still had defense bonds, they would go ahead and sell the defense bonds until they sold out and then they would sell the war bond. And then even later still, I don't remember the date, I'm sorry, they introduced the $10 bond. Formerly the $25 was the lowest denomination. But they introduced the $10 bond and uh, called it the soldier's bond because the, the, the intended purpose of the soldier's bond was to sell it to soldiers as opposed to the general public. In fact, the general public couldn't buy it. So the soldier's bond, I particularly uh, like the, the soldier's bonds. I think everybody does for a long time. 1995, when we published the book, the uh, ten dollars soldier bond was a rare, rare, rare item, and only maybe not ever even seen one, and certainly didn't own one. But the internet age has changed all that, and, and they're moderately available. Two more tens here. Um, oh, I guess nothing of great consequence here. You can look at. Uh, I get one of the things was that, oh, I see, there's two different ranks. It's, it's a, um, one of the popular ways to collect bonds, especially the, the soldier's bonds, is by rank. So here we have a PFC and a Tech 4. And I'm, I'm surprised. Now, these are both made out to men. Oh, well. So a person could re restrict themselves to uh, collecting for women. And here we have some women up here. Top one is Sergeant Juanita Kenny in Oklahoma City. And then the bottom one, uh, well, actually, is uh, it may or may not be a soldier made out to Mrs. Zelma Bean, but the medical section, WAC headquarters detachment. So was she a soldier and assigned to that WAC detachment, or was she? Uh, a civilian clerk that worked there, don't know for sure. Uh, actually, as I'm thinking about it, I don't know if a civilian clerk would have been allowed to buy it. So, oh, in fact, we also have up here, this is up here, we have the, her, her carbon copy of her purchase order to buy the, the $10 bond. And you can see also when they had made the application, it did not in include the $10 bond. So they had to add that on by typewritten edition. And so Miss Jane, here's a woman, Jane McGee. Wow, this is a spectacular bond. The, the $200 bond was also added to the, the program after Franklin Roosevelt died, I believe on April 15th, 45. April 15th, 45, yes. And um, so, uh, after he died, they came out with this commemorative $200 denomination. So this war bond, Franklin 200, is very, very rare. There, I, I know of two or three, all that I know of in all collections. Now, there's more without the war bond. When the war ended, they uh, dropped the war savings from it and just called it savings. And so those are somewhat more available than the war bond. But the war bond is very, very, very rare. So it's particularly appropriate for our purposes today to have this came from the collection of this woman. And a similar sort of situation, I gotta hurry up here a little bit, is um, this $10,000 bond series G, you'll see, was, uh, it only got saved because it was spoiled and eventually got salvaged and um, saved. 
made for women selling war bonds, the Catholic women selling war bonds. I'm rushing through here because I got myself in a jam. These were classic uh, stuffers trying to sell more bonds, trying to sell bonds. And you can collect these. These are for when a baby was born, you could give the baby this, this Disney certificate, trying to sell bonds, sell bonds, sell bonds. So this certificate was owned by a woman, uh, whatever her name is there, to replace the USS, US, or the SS Atlanta, which was sunk. And so here's when this, the replacement ship was, was christened, and there's the check that bought it help, with the help of this lady who bought the bond. And they, they made corsages out of war-saving stamps to save, uh, encourage buying of stamps and save the labor on flowers and such. Government checks in, in uh, people's name, in women's names, women as por their portraits on all kinds of different military and emergency money. And so those were allegories. Here is an actual woman. Here's Queen Wilhelmina. And then a short order for Beak Island, something that I like a lot. And here, so here in the Netherlands, the Nazis said you had to turn in your coins. So they took the coins and made brooches out of them in the hopes of fooling the, the Nazis. And then a really amazing coin, coin trench art for a Japanese soldier on the, on the Netherlands East Indies, two and a half golden coin. Mentioned just briefly, American Red Cross clubs. So here's the club, last resort on Beak Island, Red, Red, Red Cross Club, it had been in a short snorter. There's the tape marks. This was from the Angus Bruce collection, himself a World War II veteran. I chased decades for, to get him to sell me that, that note. And there's an image of Beak that was in an advertisement and another Beak short snorter here. Orders, medals, and decorations. Uh, we probably won't get through all of this. Uh, lots of fascinating things. Uh, this is the German Mother's Cross. They awarded uh, these awards to mothers, gold, silver, and bronze for how many children they raised. And this, what a wonderful medal this is. Um, this is the uh, Belgian Resistance Fighters Medal. This, this strident woman, uh, tremendous, tremendous. Medals that uh, women would have had, the Women's Army Corps Medal, yes, World War II Victory Medal. Here's the World War I British Victory Medal. Um, I, I wasn't even thinking about it when I put it in. It also has a woman, uh, it's Liberty, Winged Liberty. Uh, one of the things I was, wanted to tell you was the British, likely the name was engraved on it. The, the medals for the U.S. mostly were not. Um, campaign medals, they, would, they could have had whatever campaign medals they earned ever so quickly um, at Anzio in Italy, there, there was the Angel of Anzio, a, a, a lieutenant, got, got her name here someplace. Anyway, she and five other nurses stood their, stood their ground during a big artillery attack. And she was the, they were all awarded the Silver Star and she was the first one. So she was the very first person uh, to receive woman to receive a silver star in World War II. Uh, there were six of them got them. I'm not sure if there were any others in the whole war. Um, if, I knew that at one time, but I don't remember it today. The uh, Angel of Anzio. That uh, as long as we're talking about uh, valor awards, so there was one Medal of Honor awarded to a woman. I won't go into it a lot, but I want to. Don't say Congressional Medal of Honor, just say Medal of Honor. And you don't win the Medal of Honor, you're a recipient. Uh, I won't, won't have the discussion, I'll just share that with you. Do not call them winners of the Medal of Honor and don't call the Medal of Honor, don't call it the Congressional Medal of Honor, just call it the Medal of Honor. You can't buy or sell uh, the medals, the, the Stolen Valor Act. Uh, I'd hope to discuss that a little bit too, but a little controversial on top of everything else. 
couple last things. The Army Navy E Awards were given out to 4,000 plus companies for excellence. And I want the purpose of having this in was to show you this right here. So the company got a big banner and got very, those things. Every employee got a pin. And the women's pin was a smaller version. So it's a, the, small, the women's pin was about oh, that six tenths of an inch wide. And the men's version was about nine tenths of an inch or something. So there was men's and women's of those pins. Challenge coins, big thing now. You can buy all the challenge coins you want on online. Uh, they're a souvenir, a relatively recent innovation. Uh, arguments persist on when they started. Um, I don't like them much for the, these that you just buy them by the hundreds. If you can go to the store and, and buy new manufactured, uh, it just doesn't attract me much. But we do as our, our in the community, we issue our own every year, which we issue at MPC Fest. So this was the 2020 Challenge Coin for MPC Fest, which of course was canceled because of the virus. So here you go. If you want more, we, have, we should have some summer seminars next year uh, on military subjects. We have an annual fe MPC Fest, MPC Gram uh, is about a weekly thing and there's books from the ANA library. Whew. What are your questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Fred, for everything that you've talk, um, shared with us today. I'm gonna share the poll really quick. For those um, if you could please fill it out and then um, you can start sending in your questions using the chat feature or the Q&A feature here in Zoom. So you've had a couple questions that have come in, so I can read those to you. Um, the first question was, are we viewing part of the black hole? And they're talking about in your house. Yeah, the answer is yes. Oh, the behind me, yeah. Behind, that is the black hole, yes. Great. Um, are love tokens considered trench art? Uh, interesting question. Uh, not inherently, uh, because the key, if it's made from the detritus of, of a conflict, then it would be trench art. If it's, if it's made of a, a, a 1921 cent, it wouldn't be. Uh, so if it's, it... Uh, so all love tokens are not, but if it's made from the detritus of war, like a, a wartime coin of Australia in this case, then it is. Um, what's the actual difference between defense bonds and war bonds? Well, uh, well they have the, the legends. The, there's no actual legislative difference. It was all just raise money, raise money, sell, sell, sell. But the defense bonds say defense bonds and the war bonds say war bonds. Um, those are all the questions that have come in so far. So we'll hang out for a few more minutes and see if any more questions come in. Again, please fill, fill, out, fill out that survey so we know what you thought and how we can be better for the future. I'm trying to get go back there and show you where it says war or defense. They can, still see, can they still see the slides? Yes. All right, I don't know if on mine, uh, the registration form is the front, but right there, can you see the, it says war, it says war savings bond. Perfect, thank you. Well, we can, we'll wait about another minute and see if any more questions come through. Yeah, uh, if, if, if you guys and gals can hear me, you're letting me off your easy here. I know you must have done such a great job today. They just have no questions for you. That's it. I, I, I answered <laughs> all the questions. Well, while everybody's finishing up that survey, um, our next presentation that we're going to have is going to be next Wednesday, excuse me, next Tuesday. It's going to be our membership and literary awards. Um, it's on our website if you haven't been able to register for it yet. So we are, um, or we are giving recognition to everybody that couldn't come to the World's Fair of Money. So the memberships and all of those that we would have done at the World's Fair of Money, we're gonna do here in Zoom. And then next Wednesday is our service awards. So register for those. Um, it's gonna be just like you see today, where you're gonna see the speakers and then you will be in the attendance mode like you are today. Um, you can send in your um, questions and your applauses and all of those things to the chat. So join us for those, it's gonna be a great time.
All right, another question came in. It said, what about uncashed bar, excuse me, war bonds? Very good question. Uh, the presumption that most people have when they see an uncashed bond, uh, if it's cashed, it'd be like a check. It'll be canceled on the back. The information will be filled in and it may be canceled some way on the face. Usually it'll have to be canceled somehow on the face. So the assumption usually is the people, they assume that if they find one that has no indication it's been cashed, that it's lost money, that the government got to keep the money and the, and the, the individual never got their money. But that isn't necessarily so. These were registered bonds. That's why they have the names on them. They're registered. So as a registered bond, if, you, if it's lost or stolen, you could apply and have it reissued. So sometimes, some of these bonds that we see in our collections that appear to be unredeemed are in fact reissued. So a bond was reissued, was lost, let's say, and then reissued, and then 25 years later, they find, or somebody else finds their errors, find whatever, the, the now replaced bonds, and they find their way into the collector's hands. We have two more questions and then we'll, um, we'll conclude for the day. Were women paid the same as men in the army? Ah, great question. Um, the, the, the nurses were not. Um, the nurses were not. Uh, and I just recently read that in, uh, I don't remember where I read that. Read it in some detail. I don't. I don't know the answer about the Women's Army Corps. I don't know the answer. I would have said. I would have said yes. They were paid the same, but since I learned that the nurses were not, then uh, although on the other hand there were almost no male nurses, uh, it was just one of the things you didn't have in the '40s. All right. Last question for today. Uh, I guess it's more of a, a comment. It says there are MPC uh, mini fests at the numismatic meetings, including the ANA, if you want to learn more. So that's great information for everybody. Yes, good. At, thank you, whoever. Sounds like Bill. Yes. Sounds like Bill Myers. It may have been. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. We really appreciate your time today. Um, if you uh, again, if you haven't signed up for the awards presentations next week, please do so. And we thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful weekend. Bye, everybody. <laughs>